Good afternoon. Thank you for attending our Baby's First Test webinar, Critical Congenital Heart Disease Screening and the HeartSmart Expanding Borders series. A few housekeeping items before we start. All participants are muted during this webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the questions section on your webinar panel. Our presenter will answer these questions at the end of the presentation. Now on to the webinar. Today's webinar will highlight the work that Children's National Medical Center has completed in partnership with Babies First Test to champion, de champion, develop, and disseminate educational resources on CCHD to both parents and health care providers. The presenter for this webinar is Lisa A. Holm. Ms. Holm is a collaborative practice facilitator for the Children's National Heart Institute, where she oversees champions and facilitates quality and performance improvement work with clinical teams to improve outcomes for children with congenital heart disease and for their families. Prior to joining Children's National Heart Institute, she had the unique opportunity to work both as a regulatory counsel, focusing primarily on healthcare issues at the state level, and as a pediatric intensive care nurse, caring directly for children with critical congenital heart disease. Ms. Holm holds the a JD from George Mason University School of Law, where she served as an associate editor of the George Mason Law Review and obtained her bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary. Ms. Holm will start, now start her presentation. Well, thank you so much, Talia, for that welcome, and thank you to Baby's First Test for this opportunity to present some of the work we've been doing in collaboration both with Genetic Alliance and through the Challenge Award um, with Baby's First Test. We've been really grateful for Baby's First Test and Genetic Alliance for their collaboration and expertise in helping us get the word out on critical congenital heart disease screening. First, I wanted to start with a little bit about who we are. So Children's National Medical Center was established in 1870, and that's the photograph on the left in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., just after the Civil War. And it was established as a hospital for orphans who had been made orphans through the Civil War. Um, originally, it was a 16-bed facility, and since then, we have emerged and expanded considerably. Uh, the picture on the right is our current building, um, and we are a world-class provider of pediatric health care, serving children both locally and internationally in all 50 states, as well as 40 countries. In 2009, Children's National established the Congenital Heart Disease Screening Program um, through a grant opportunity that Dr. Martin first established with Elizabeth Bradshaw. Um, Elizabeth Bradshaw has been an awesome member of our team. She since is moved to part-time, and we still consult with her regularly. But the other members of our team are Joseph Wright, who provides strategic leadership and helps us with our access advocacy efforts. Um, the photograph of the person next to Dr. Martin is myself, um, and then below me is Lindsay Attaway, who is our program coordinator for the Heart Institute, and she is amazing. I don't know what our program would do without her. So that's our small team um, here at Children's National. I also wanted to give you a little bit of background about why this webinar is particularly relevant today. Um, so critical congenital heart disease screening has been expanding rapidly across both the United States and internationally. And so we'll examine some of those efforts later in this presentation. And a lot of the research that's come out is very timely and is ongoing. Um, from the beginning, education was identified as an issue. And so that's why we've been so grateful for this partnership with Babies First Test that started way back in 2011. Um, and so we'll go over today what is critical congenital heart disease screening, how is it performed, and what are the Heart Smart Expanding Borders videos, and what has been the impact of these videos. So I'd like to share the story of Veronica Easley. Veronica is the baby on the left, and she is the daughter of Elizabeth. Olivia Easley, a physician and mother who has been an amazing advocate in Maryland. When Veronica was born, she showed no signs or symptoms of critical congenital heart disease. She went on and passed away, actually, around two weeks of age in her sleep. Um, the baby on the right is a baby that was also born in Maryland. Um, 
at a hospital that was an early adapter for critical congenital heart disease screening using pulse oximetry. Um, this baby's heart disease was caught in the newborn nursery, and she was able to get the surgical interventions necessary to save her life. She's actually doing fine. Um, Veronica Easley, her mother was an FDA physician, and she's gone on to become an amazing advocate and um, started a parent group to advocate for critical congenital heart disease screening. Um, and so this story just illustrates from looking at these two photographs, it's very difficult to assess which baby based on things like clinical signs and symptoms and cyanosis. Um, as to which baby has heart disease. So congenital heart disease is the most common birth defect um, occurring in about eight of every thousand births. The critical form of the critical forms of congenital heart disease occur in about three out of every thousand births. Um, so the critical form of congenital heart disease includes heart disease um, anomalies that require intervention within the first year of life, either surgical intervention or intervention through cardiac catheterization. Congenital heart disease accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the deaths, all deaths, that occur from congenital anomalies. And the majority of these deaths do occur in the first year of life and even the first two weeks of life as the infant's physiology changes from fetal to newborn circulation. This slide illustrates a study that came out of California. And it was a 15-year retrospective study that looked at infants who died of critical congenital heart disease in California. And what this study found was that over 50% of those deaths due to critical congenital heart disease were attributed to late or misdiagnosis. And so late or misdiagnosis is the death that would occur at home or babies that would come in through emergency room department visits um, and who were discharged from the hospital without being diagnosed with critical congenital heart disease. So if you were to extrapolate those numbers in California for um, local numbers, in BC we have about 10,000 births a year. And so this would mean, on average, four to five babies would be late diagnosis babies who could die from a misdiagnosis. And that would fit in. Um, with the data that we see in, at Children's Hospital. And over that 15-year period, we didn't see a significant increase um, or improvement in those numbers. So why is detecting these newborns with critical congenital heart disease so difficult? Physicians have already had, physicians have always had, or for a long time had, several tools available, such as fetal ultrasound and clinical assessment. So fetal ultrasound usually only detects about 23 to 60% of babies with critical congenital heart disease. And so the 60% figures um, come from Germany, where they've gotten very good at developing fetal ultrasound assessments. And most of the rest of the world, including England and the United States, is more in the 30 to 50% range. Um, so physical examination, why are these babies not detected in a delivery room or in the newborn nursery through auscultation, palpitation of pulses, and assessment for cyanosis? Sorry. Um, so physical examination only detects about 50% due to changes on the patency of the baby's um, patent vectus arteriosus. And so often these critical congenital heart disease diagnoses, they are also missed because often babies don't have a murmur in that initial newborn period. So this slide illustrates the diagnostic gap that we've been speaking of. So you'll see that prenatally, anywhere from 25 to, in some countries, 60 percent of babies are identified using prenatal assessment. Uh, clinical assessment in the newborn period prior to discharge will catch another 
25 to 40%. And then late or missed diagnosis of babies that don't die but come in and are caught either at a clinic visit or uh, soon after discharge and survive um, make up the rest. And then there are, at the top, babies that we miss and ultimately pass away. So why is it so hard to detect cyanosis? And cyanosis is a bluish discoloration around the eyes, lips, and other extremities. Um, so normal newborn saturation is around 95%. Um, and that's if you have a hemoglobin of 17.5 or greater. You'll, you'll be able to see that cyanosis around 80%. And so this chart was developed by a neonatologist that illustrates what we call the cyanotic blind spot. Um, so a human eye is not able to detect visible cyanosis until um, oxygen saturation levels are around 80%. And so one research study using clinical staff, meaning doctors and nurses, actually found that for their research, the mean threshold for detecting cyanosis was as low as 69%. So the bottom line from this slide is that physicians and nursery staff simply are unable to see with their own eyes um, this cyanosis. So hospitals have had a tool available to them called pulse oximetry. And if any of you have been in the hospital or have had an assessment that involves pulse oximetry, it's the, an adult that looks like a clothespin clamp with a red light, kind of like an ET finger. Um, so that's pulse oximetry. And what that does is measures the oxygen saturation level of hemoglobin in the arterial blood. Pulse ox is a quick, non-painful, non-invasive test that just takes a couple minutes to perform and will tell you what the baby's oxygen saturation level is. So this is a picture of normal newborn circulation where the blood comes in through the right atrium, then goes down to the right ventricle, and then if you follow the uh, blue arrows out to the pulmonary arteries, it is um, oxygenated in the lungs and then comes back in through the left atrium, back into the left ventricle where it pumps out into the systemic system. And so that baby would have a 95 to 100 percent passing rate for pulse oximetry. And it's fully oxygenated blood. These are the primary screening targets of critical congenital heart disease. Um, there are other forms of critical congenital heart disease that are not primary targets that can also be detected using pulse oximetry, but due to the way newborn physiology is, can also be missed. So we like to say that pulse oximetry just gives clinical folks one more tool for detecting critical congenital heart disease. This is a picture of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And hypoplastic left heart syndrome is one of the most severe forms of critical congenital heart disease. Um, and it's dependent on a mixing of the blood that occurs either through the patent ductus arteriosus or through an atrial septal defect. And so research has shown that up to 78% of babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome are discharged home from hospitals without being detected. And this, this particular syndrome is almost universally fatal without, um, if, not, if it's not detected in that initial newborn period. So that baby would have a failing oxygen saturation level of about 90%. Um, so there are also secondary targets that can be discovered through pulse, ox pulse oximetry screening. And some of those include non-cardiac issues, such as pneumonia, respiratory illness, or sepsis and infection. Those babies would also have um, low oxygenation of their arterial blood at, with oxygen saturations around 
So in 2009, the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics felt that they did support critical congenital heart disease screening using pulse ox, but that more population-based studies and inflammation implementation studies were needed before they made a recommendation. So what they found was that critical congenital heart disease is not detected in some infants. A failure to detect critical congenital heart disease is associated with significant morbidity and occasional mortality, and that pulse oximetry can be used to help detect CCHD. So soon after that 2009 statement, two impressive studies came to us through the U European experience. One of those came out of Sweden, and this is a study that was done um, examining 46,000 live births in Sweden, where it compared physical exams alone to physical exam and pulse oximetry. And as you can see, the results here are impressive. We went from sensitivity and specificity from the 60s to the 80s. Um, and so sensitivity is how good is the test at picking up the disease, and specificity is how often is it accurate. Um, so you can tell from this study that both sensitivity and specificity were excellent. It's also interesting to note, um, I mentioned the secondary targets. And this study also found that false positives for critical congenital heart disease using pulse oximetry were often true positives for other pathologies, such as their secondary target respiratory illness, sepsis, and pneumonia. So this study came out of England, and it was a meta-analysis done and published in May of 2012 in the British Medical Journal. And it examined 13 primary studies that had strong scientific backing for pulse oximetry with a very low false positive rate of 0.14% and a high um, sensitivity rate of 76.5%. And this is based on um, about almost 300,000 infants in England. This paper is a paper that was put out by Dr. Martin and Elizabeth Bradshaw. Um, and what it was was a feasibility study done at Holy Cross Hospital in Maryland showing that the implementation of pulse oximetry screening for congenital heart disease can be done in a community hospital. And not only that, it can be done with no extra staff added um, and very few barriers, only 1.4% of the screening the nurses or hospital staff report either technical barriers with, um, with equipment or barriers in terms of um, education or workflow. And so the average time to screen was under four minutes. Um, another important thing that they found was that um, the thoroughness in terms of eligibility criteria um, when they first started doing this at Holy Cross, they found that they were missing a few eligible babies every week. But once they had their first positive, in terms of finding that first baby that was identified through the use of pulse oximetry, they found that they um, were then the screeners in the nursery, the um, thoroughness went up to 100% of the babies who were being screened prior to leaving the newborn nursery after that first um, good catch. And they also found um, that CCHD screening using pulse ox did not result in a significant increase in echoes. So if a baby had a positive screen, um, it would be assessed both for the secondary and primary targets, as well as an assessment by a pediatric cardiologist and an echocardiogram to rule out critical congenital heart disease screening. So only seven more echoes were ordered as a result of this study in this hospital. Um, so this study came to us from Dr. Yor in England, and what they were examining was whether or not false positives um, increased anxiety in families. And what they found was that families liked this, and that um, knowing that knowing that they have another way of identifying babies for further evaluation for heart disease actually uh, was a good thing, and so that's this study from England. 
So after all of these large population studies and feasibility research, um, the next steps in the United States were to have a meeting of all of the major stakeholders. Um, I think you can make out, it's, it's a small picture, but um, we had several physicians, including um, Dr. Gail Pearson and Dr. Gerard Martin, were there represented at this HRSA work group meeting at the American College of Cardiology Heart House here in DC. And so um, following that meeting, Secretary Sebelius put out in September of 2011, um, her recommendation to add critical congenital heart disease screening using Pulsox to the recommended newborn screening panel. Um, so we had a second stakeholders meeting following this recommendation in February of 2012. Um, and that paper came out, I believe, um, this past June. And this is the current nationally recommended protocol for critical congenital heart disease screening. Um, it looks like a lot of boxes, but the only three that are really different that you need to know uh, to understand how to use the pulse oximetry algorithm is um, the top three boxes. And so the fail box is any baby that has a pulse ox of 89% or less and either the right hand or foot is an immediate fail and needs to have an assessment done for primary and secondary targets. For babies who have pulse ox numbers in both the right hand and foot of 90 to 94 percent or a difference of 4 percent or more between the two, that baby is a repeat, a retest and you can repeat that test up to three times. If the baby falls into that retest category the third time, um, the action is to not repeat and to begin to assess the baby for primary and secondary targets. Um, if the baby has a pulse oximetry screen result of 95% or more in the right hand or foot, and a difference of 3% or less between the two, um, you would then consider that baby uh, a pass, and you would just provide normal newborn care and keep a lookout for signs and symptoms um, of heart disease. And so that baby would be considered a pass. And this is the nationally recommended algorithm as it currently exists that's endorsed by um, not only the American College of Cardiology, but also the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as the March of Dimes and the American Heart Association. So once we have that recommendation in place at the federal level, it was then left to the state to decide whether or not they were going to mandate it. Um, so in 2011, Indiana and Maryland were the first states to pass CCHD screening legislation, and New Jersey was the first state to implement CCHD screening in their state. Um, this photograph, uh, Children's National was very involved in the Maryland legislation and we went to testify. Um, there's Dr. Martin and Elizabeth Bradshaw in this photograph when they ultimately signed the bill making it mandatory. Um, since 2011, um, mandates have increased. In fact, just in the first half of 2013, 20 states enacted legislation requiring this as a mandatory screen. So the current total is about 33 states uh, with legislation pending and several more. Um, this map is just to give you an idea of how quickly the landscape has changed nationally in the U.S. Um, this map is available online at the 1 in 100 Newborn Co Coalition website and they update it regularly. Um, so you can tell just from looking at the difference between June of last year and September of this year, how many more states, and so the green states are the ones that have enacted um, mandatory legislation requiring CCHD screening. Children's National has also had the um, fortunate opportunity to work internationally. Um, in 2011, we started working with the health authority in Abu Dhabi. Um, in the first year, they screened 23,000 infants and 13 babies with a critical congenital heart disease were discovered through pulse ox screening. 
And that's a picture of Dr. Martin um, in Abu Dhabi. So the second year results, um, we screened, or I'm sorry, they screened nearly 50,000 babies and 21 cases of CCHD have been detected. Um, we also have international partners in Kuwait. Um, as well as England and Mexico. And this is just a map showing some of those partners in the Middle East. Um, the Middle East actually is probably the first country to have all of their Ministry of Health hospitals um, in Kuwait are currently screening and one private hospital. So they were the first um, in 2011, 2012 to really have that universal um, pulse oximetry screening for all of their state hospitals in place. In June of this year, Dr. Martin traveled to um, Torino, Italy to meet with a group of stakeholders from Europe, including neonatologists and researchers. Um, I think Anne Grinelli and Dr. Yor, who initially had those two big population-based studies published, uh, also were there. And what they were doing is to try to strategize for a uniform recommendation in Europe. Um, and so they decided that what made the most sense would be to start pilot programs. Um, and Sweden is, is quite far advanced ahead of the rest of Europe um, in terms of implementation. And um, the Netherlands actually is just starting. I think their start date is October 8th for a pilot project they're doing. Um, and then the UK, and Italy, and Germany, and Spain are also very involved with um, getting either pilot studies up and running or continuing their efforts. Um, so what's next in terms of pulse oximetry screening for critical congenital heart disease? Um, so HRSA has several demonstration projects where they've given funds to the various states, um, and those projects will last approximately three years, and those are ongoing. I know. Babies First Test, as well as Children's National, has, have been involved in their technical assistance uh, webinars and phone calls. Um, another big area that we have been discussing with industry leaders is how to improve um, the health information exchange in terms of getting the data from the hospitals to be able to report it to things like um, state departments of health. and so. I think that some of the leading pulse oximetry manufacturers have several things in the pipeline that are just waiting for FDA approval in terms of embedding the um, nationally endorsed algorithm into the pulse oximeter device so that you can just know um, based on the num based on the baby's numbers whether or not they're a pass, fail, or retest. Um, so those are up and coming. Um, the CDC recently put out a cost effectiveness study earlier this summer, I think it might have just been last month, um, and NIH is looking as well. Um, so throughout all of this, one thing that has continued to be a need is to develop educational resources to be able to allow for widespread implementation, both nationally and internationally. And that's where I want to switch this presentation over a little bit and talk about um, the HeartSmart expanding, video, expanding Borders videos. Um, that Children's National has developed in collaboration with Babies First Test. So in 2011, we were awarded our first challenge award, and our goals for that first year um, that was implemented in 2012 were to create two web-based videos. One video would be geared towards providers, educating providers, and the second video was geared towards educating families and advocates of pulse oximetry screening. Um, so we went on, due to the success and popularity of those videos, we uh, applied for and were able to receive a second challenge award um, in 2013. And we are just finishing that up with My Baby's First Test in terms of making this happen. And the goal for that was to really improve access to these educational tools. Um, some of the feedback we got back from our 2012 um, videos was that hospitals, some hospitals don't allow access to YouTube. So these were web-based videos, and sometimes clinical staff w wasn't able to access them due to restrictions at the hospital security level in terms of allowing access to YouTube and uh, videos. 
So we wanted to create DVDs of the video that would be available at no charge and that we could send to these hospitals to use as part of their training. We also really wanted to address uh, the request for these videos in other languages. And um, so a lot of non-English speaking families could be educated as well as um, address as well as use for use in, in the international community. So first we'll go through um, the content of what the HeartSmart Expanding Borders videos were in 2012 in terms of the provider or parent videos. So the provider video provided uh, both the how and why of pulse oximetry screening in terms of what the physiological changes were. Um, there's some automated versions of the pictures that we looked at of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and the newborn heart, and it goes through in more detail um, some of those uh, physiological changes that occur, as well as um, potential complications and how to speak with families um, to educate them on CCHD screening. Um, so screening in your unit, we recommend in the video to pair the screening with other standard of care newborn screens that are already occurring at the hospital, and so that improves both compliance and sustainability in terms of making sure that it's implemented um, in a place that makes sense. And so some hospitals choose to pair it with the metabolic screen, and others, we've also seen them successfully pair with the hearing screen. Uh, we do recommend, though, because the blood spot is a, a prick to do the full flex symmetry screening first if, if a hospital chooses to, um, to pair it with the metabolic screen so that the baby's not crying and, and screaming, which can interfere with the pulse flex numbers during the screen. Um, and the video also contains a list of do's and don'ts. So some of the do's that we highlight are um, things like how to place the sensor and what the best sites are for infants, including the great toe, thumb, and the outer aspects of the palm and foot. Um, we also encourage families, or we also encourage nursery staff to not um, use other sites, such as sometimes you'll see the pulse oximeter wrapped around the baby's wrist, which um, manufacturers have found through testing that, that doesn't give as good of a reading as using the palm, the foot, the toe or the um, thumb. So some pulse oximetry don'ts that are included on the video. Um, never use an adult clip for an infant. Um, don't perform the test in bright light. Uh, you can use a blanket to help kind of shade the testing area or the baby's limb, um, as well as some common sense things like don't put the pulse oximeter on the same limb as a blood pressure cuff or use your own hand to kind of hold the sensor to the pistol to the infant skin because the um, sensor will actually pick up your own pulse and stop pulse oximetry reading. Um, this photograph just illustrates those four sites that are recommended as the best sites to use on an infant. Um, and then also the pulse oximeter that is sort of recommended for pulse oximetry screening is just one that's been approved by the FDA and is motion tolerant. Uh, approved by the FDA for use in newborns, sorry. Um, and so this shows two different types, the disposable probe and the reusable probe. Um, so some of the clever sayings that nursery staff have helped come up with to remember um, which so the two readings on the right hand and either foot. So the pre-ductal fat is the one on the right hand. And to help them remember that, they've come up with the saying, right is right, meaning um, the pre-ductal oxygenation saturation should be gotten on the right hand. And then um, in order to help them remember which way the sensor goes, the red light emitter goes on the top. And a lot of manufacturers have a little star, or some manufacturers, sorry, have a little star or a little bar that will mark which side goes on top. And the things associated with that are either um, raise the bar or star to the sky. Um, so the parent video that was developed last year includes um, some different things, including a family story that we shared to start out this presentation, interviews um, of Veronica Easley and other parents whose babies have been identified using pulse oximetry screening. Um, 
the why and how of Colfax and what the next steps are if a baby screen is positive. So one thing we encourage um, screeners to educate parents on is that Colfax symmetry screens are just a screen. It's not a diagnostic tool, meaning the baby can still have a heart problem that is not identified through pulse oximetry screening. Um, so the parent video also includes the signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease, including um, falling asleep during feeding and failure to gain weight, um, cyanosis, meaning pale or bluish skin color, um, poor weight gain, um, puffy hands or feet, um, irritability and difficulty to console. And so uh, we also point parents to other resources such as the Baby's First Test website um, and links to other parents' sites um, for giving them an idea of what the other newborn screens are as well as uh, information about the disease itself. And the CDC also has a great website. Um, and so that's all included in the parent video. So 2013, uh, we started this project with Baby's First Test in January 2013. And they were excellent at helping give us um, some of the technical expertise in terms of identifying um, populations in, in terms of which languages um, we should translate the videos into first. Um, as well as making sure that they were culturally sensitive and how best to get the word out there in terms of dissemination of the videos. And so um, this is where the videos are currently located. The web-based versions are available online at YouTube, Baby's First Test, and Vimo. And the languages that we were able to translate them into this year are Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish. And we were, we were only able to translate the parent video into these additional languages. The video for providers just remains in English only. Um, in terms of dissemination, uh, Baby's First Test has been a great partner in terms of trying to reach major stakeholders that would be interested and would find this education valuable, including state departments of health as far away as Alaska. Um, we've had many state ask for these videos and have started using them and posting them to their own websites. Uh, we've had requests from nursing schools, um, parent advocacy groups, industry partners, um, individual hospitals, as well as professional associations. Um, Dr. Martin and I have shared the videos as an educational resource at both conferences and Grand Rounds presentations. And I've been working locally with um, some of the teams at DC hospitals um, and I've heard some ideas where they've um, implemented the parent videos um, either during prenatal tours and birthing classes as well as new parent classes that are given on the unit. Um, some of the other things that I've heard that have worked well for various hospitals are to include the um, provider education and skills days as well as orientation for new nursing and tech staff. Um, this is a map just showing uh, some of the various countries that have implemented or are thinking about implementing CCHD screening using pulse oximetry. Um, we've sent the videos all over the world, as you can see, as well as um, I think we're up to about 15 to 20 different states. Um, so we, these videos came out in July of this year, and we probably mailed just under 300 uh, copy of the hard copies. Um, this picture actually was just sent to Elizabeth yesterday. Um, and this is Dr. Ramos. And he has a, a Facebook site, Pulfox Mexico. And he's been great. He's been a great advocate in Mexico of um, implementation of critical congenital heart disease screening using Pulfox symmetry. And you can tell right here in the, in the picture that he's um, using the Spanish version to help educate some neonatologists and OBGYNs at a conference in Mexico. 
So how do you get copies? If you're interested in a hard copy, um, you can send a request to our email, pollfox at cnmc.org, and include uh, what your name is, your organization, as well as um, which videos you would like us to send you copies of. Um, Children's National also developed a toolkit which has been used widely. Um, and this is to sort of help hospitals that wanted to implement critical congenital heart disease screening using Pulsox but didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And so it includes some of the strategies and recommendations that we've discussed today in this presentation, as well as um, various tests and competencies for providers. It has um, some advocacy stories and resources and quotes. Um, and basically, it comes with a PowerPoint as well that can help um, clinical staff educate um, both families and others on introducing the idea of implementation of CCHD screening. We also have a website um, that gets over 1,000 hits a month. And that's um, on our Children's National website. It's the Poll Fox page. Um, we also have an online community where if you're interested in getting a login and password, it's basically have a um, blog where we post um, new, new abstract, links to new abstracts on CCHD research that comes out, um, as well as a place, an open forum for providers to talk about how implementation is going in their hospital, as well as helping each other shoot, uh, troubleshoot barriers. Um, so this is just a list of some of, just a few of the other resources online that are very helpful for um, resources in terms of educational material, both for providers and families on CCHD screening. And with that, um, I guess I finished a little bit early, Talia, but I'll go ahead and turn the webinar back over to Talia, and um, please, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And um, please feel free to email either Dr. Martin or myself at Children's National if you have any questions about um, the content and what we've talked about in this presentation today. So thank you very much, Talia. This has been such a great opportunity. No problem, Lisa. We actually do have a few questions for you. The first question that I have is, how many states screen for CCHD? OK, so if we go back to that national map, um, there are about 32 or 33. I think there was one state where it passed the legislature, and then it was waiting for the governor's signature. And I'm not sure if it ended up being 32 or 33 as of right this second. Um, and then we know that a lot of other states have implemented pilot projects where either the legislative mandate failed this year or last year, and it, it's not required, but they're still kind of doing it on their own. So I would say um, we try to look at the numbers in terms of where babies are being born. We think as, me, as many as 90% of babies born in the United States are now being screened, maybe 80 to 90% or will be through the mandates that were enacted. And different states have different start dates. But um, that's, that's kind of as much as I know. It's, it's about 33 states, with, and then there's six or so demonstration projects through HRSA, and then some various kind of on their own pilot projects. OK, hey, great. Um, another question that we had was, what was the biggest challenge that your team faced in doing this project? The biggest challenge? <laughs> Hmm. You know, if you talk to Dr. Martin, I think he would say that it was convincing pediatric cardiologists because they're experts in the field. And, you know, this is a, a great tool for helping provide um, pediatricians and neonatologists in the newborn nursery. So it's not really meant for, um, so, you know, the protocol was designed to be used in normal newborn nurseries, not sort of the level three NICUs. And so I think you know, if you were to ask Dr. Martin, he would probably say convincing pediatric cardiologists that this was a helpful tool. And you know, because they're very good at doing those newborn assessments and you know, picking up murmurs and cyanosis, but not every you know, community hospital or nursery has the benefit of having a pediatric cardiologist assess every single normal newborn. So I think that's what they, he would say was one of the biggest challenges from the get-go. OK, great. 
And now that you've disseminated the videos, what is the plan to um, continue this dissemination or grow from this project? Sure. Yeah. No. Thanks for that. Is that is that your question, Talia? Yes. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. No. Fantastic. And so, um, you know, we we have just started. I, in my mind, we've just started disseminating the the hard copy videos, and we've already had. I think. I want to say in the range of 2,000 hit just on one of those three three sites that we posted. Um, so we're going to continue to get the word out through webinars like this one. Um, we would love to be able to present this at various conferences. Um, we also, let's see, what else are we doing? Um, we've gotten we've gotten some requests from. Uh, some of the state departments of health that we've sent the videos to for translation into other languages, then we'll have to talk more about, um, you know, maybe trying to develop funding to to translate into additional languages as well. All right, great. And you know, we are definitely open to suggestions if you have any ideas too for good forums or other ways to sort of get the educational material that was developed through the Challenge Awards out. Um, we're happy to, to have those ideas. Um, so please feel free to email them, you know, Thalia and anybody else on the call who think of other ways to sort of get this educational material to people who would use them. Great. One of our um, attendees wanted to know, is the DVD information available on the Newborn channel? Yes. Actually, I don't know if it's live yet, but um, that, that is one place where it will be available if it's not already. And another one of, I think Lindsay on our program staff is looking into that. Um, so yes, that is the plan. I don't know if it's live yet, though. Okay. And then we also had another question um, regarding any sort of recommendations for screening in the NICU. So there have been various NICUs that have developed NICU protocols, but there's no nationally endorsed sort of recommended um, protocol for screening in NICUs yet. And if you're interested, I can email you. I know we have one here at CNMC, um, and I know there's a lot of other. I think the Texas group has also done a lot of research um, out there on, on trying to implement um, pulse ox screening in NICUs. Um, so ha I would be happy to share our protocol that we use at Children's National in our NICU, as well as kind of point, point you in the direction of the Texas team. I think that it was Texas POP. Um, but yeah, feel free to email me if you want that information, but there's no nationally endorsed NICU screening protocol. It's kind of just um, certain NICUs have developed their own protocols. And our final question is, how, do, how can you get a copy of the protocol as algorithm? Oh, if you want to email pollfox at cnmc.org, we can send you a copy of the toolkit and the algorithm is in there as a PDF. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for attending our webinar. This webinar will be uploaded to babiesfirsttest.org in the coming weeks. So please feel free to visit our site to listen to this and other webinars, as well as find out additional information about our webinar and our webinar series. Before ending, I'd like to make an announcement stating that we are accepting requests for proposals for our 2014 Challenge Awards. You can visit babiesfirsttest.org to find more information about it. This webinar has ended, and thank you again for attending.